Novocherkask, South Russia, the old capital of the Cossacks on the River Don. One summer's day in June 1962, a workers' demonstration came marching past Leonid Tolstoletov's balcony. I could hear them chanting, freedom, freedom, but I didn't understand what it was they wanted, what they were all on about. There was a huge crowd, some carrying banners with slogans. But it was this chant, freedom, freedom, which really caught my attention. They marched up to the first line of soldiers. They let them through. There was a second line of soldiers, and they let them through too. The third line of soldiers opened fire on the unarmed demonstrators. The massacre at Novocherkask was kept secret. Nobody here has ever talked about it. It began at the electric engine works. The biggest train factory in the empire employing 10,000 people. On the 1st of June 1962, the morning shift arrived to find that food prices had risen overnight by up to 30%. The workers downed tools. Someone set off the factory siren and metal worker Piotr Suda came in to find the Novocherkask electric engine works on strike. Their demands were simple and clear. A big poster went up here. Two of the workers painted it. They brought it along and hung it up over there. It said, more meat, more butter, more housing. It was all directed personally against Khrushchev. They stopped a train at the station too and wrote a slogan on it. We'll have Khrushchev for sausages. Next morning, thousands of demonstrators marched to the town center. They arrived at the local party headquarters. Inside, local communists were entertaining party bosses from Moscow. Some of the demonstrators got into the building and took action. Our comrades came out of the party offices onto the balcony carrying a tray. There were half-drunk bottles of cognac on it and empty glasses, sausage and all sorts of other tasty tidbits. These comrades wanted to show the rest of us standing down here what our leaders were up to. By now the square was full of people. There were soldiers guarding the party building. The mood was tense. Children had climbed into the trees to get a better look. Then the shooting started. They were firing warning shots. They fired into the trees, but there were kids sitting up there. Well, you know how curious kids are. I didn't see the children fall, but I heard them, crying, screaming, sobbing children. I could hear it all from where I was standing at the edge of the square. I heard it all. It's not clear whether the soldiers were ordered to shoot or whether they panicked. Inside the party headquarters, there were desperate calls to Moscow. Major Yuri Vnukov arrived to take charge of the clearing up. In the middle of the square was a pool of blood. We didn't count how many people had been killed. They called in the fire service to try and clean the blood up. They hosed it down, but it wasn't any good. During the night, the blood had dried into the tarmac on the square. So we sent for a lorry load of sand and ten cleaners. When they came, we used the hoses and the sand and scrubbed it all with brushes. We managed to clear up the worst of the blood and restore some sort of order. There were bits and pieces of clothing lying all over the square. Jackets, shawls, caps, all sorts of hats, boots. So we swept them all up, put them in a lorry and carted them away. I was 
What amazed me was we'd been brought up from childhood to believe that this is the land of socialism, the USSR, which puts human beings first. I would never have believed that here, right here in this square, they could shoot their own people point blank. I just couldn't believe it. The dead were buried in unmarked graves in secret places. The graves have never been found. The number of dead has never been admitted. Khrushchev was not as safe as he looked. He had tried hard to increase food production with innovative farming policies. But his determination to plow up the virgin lands of Central Asia and Siberia ended in disaster. It was too much too soon. Half the virgin lands ended up a dust bowl. His budget problems forced Khrushchev to consider spending cuts. One obvious target, the armed forces. He demobilized millions of men and slashed military spending. Politically, he was isolated. International embarrassment was the last straw. Khrushchev and Fidel Castro faced the world together, but the party was losing patience. The Cuban Missile Crisis was an undignified public humiliation. Khrushchev's enemies began to move in for the kill. He made things easy for them by continually putting his foot in it. One day, he stepped across from the Kremlin to the Manege Gallery here. They showed him a room full of expressionist paintings. Of course, he lost his temper. This one must have been daubed with a donkey's tail, he said. That one looks like the contents of a baby's nappy. It was an embarrassing scene. There was one last great show of unity his 70th birthday on April the 17th, 1964. He was awarded the medal Hero of the Soviet Union by Head of State Leonid Brezhnev. <laughs> Hair-brained scheming, boasting and empty words were the charges against the man who won the space race. usual, hero's welcome was laid on for the spacewalking cosmonauts on their return to Moscow. But as they marched down the red carpet, the newsreel camera never revealed exactly who was there to greet them. The men who'd called Khrushchev back from holiday and sacked him now formed a collective leadership. Khrushchev's fall from grace was sudden and complete. A teacher asked one of his grandsons what the old man did all day. Mostly, Grandad cries, the child said. He died peacefully after a walk in the woods to gather mushrooms.
May Day 1965, and the new leadership presented itself to the nations of the USSR. Party and army had had enough of Khrushchev and his roller coaster. Now the watchword was stability, in particular stability of jobs for communists. The new general secretary was Leonid Brezhnev. He kept his job for 18 years. The new regime wanted to put the lid back on dissent after Khrushchev's thaw. Among the first to feel the effects of the new policy was the satirical writer Andrei Sinyavsky, now in exile in Paris. I was arrested in broad daylight in the street as I was coming out of the college where I used to lecture. Right there in broad daylight on a crowded street, they just whisked me away. Nobody in the crowd noticed. That's how skilled they were at arresting people. They just shoved me into a car. It struck me that nobody had noticed that someone had been arrested in the middle of the street. Freedom of speech was theoretically guaranteed by the Soviet Constitution. These arrests marked a new gap between theory and practice. Protesters gathered in Moscow's Pushkin Square on Constitution Day in December 1965. The dissenters argued that a lot of the Soviet Constitution was excellent in theory if only the government would stick to it. They raised placards saying, observe the Soviet Constitution. The police responded by arresting them. The next demonstrators simply stood here and took their hats off. Of course, they were arrested too. Sinyavsky and Daniel were the first writers ever to stand trial for spreading anti-Soviet propaganda. The judge was worse than the prosecutor. He took every opportunity to help the prosecutor out. He wouldn't let me talk at all, kept on interrupting. I'd be trying to explain something to the court and he'd cut me off, move on to another question. I had the feeling they were just out to hunt me down. Apart from that, what shocked me, what shocks me to this day, was the reaction of the spectators in the court. They applauded the prosecutor. They applauded with glee when the sentence was read out. Even the writers were clapping. Of course, it was painful, but inside I had to laugh. Everything I'd written really was true. In fact, it was nothing compared to this fantastic scene. Sinyavsky was in the camps when, in August 1968, Brezhnev met Alexander Dubček. His talks with the Czechoslovak communist were described as a broad, comradely exchange of opinion. In 1968, I was an officer of Red Army. I was in, uh, on the border with Czechoslovakia. It was uh, lots, lots of troops were waiting uh, uh, one month, two months. It was a big tension, and nobody uh, knows what will happen. So our political commissars explain what is the problem, and they explain to us what can be solution. The problem, according to them, is uh, Western uh, capitalists, uh, British, American, West Germans, uh, an internal Czechoslovakian contribution, try to destroy socialism in uh, Czechoslovakia. All Czechoslovakian people like to protect socialism, and if Czechoslovakian people will ask us, we have to help them. The Soviet troops sent to destroy the Prague Spring were surprised to find that they were not welcomed as liberators. The rape of Czechoslovakia left aggressors and victims in shock. In Prague there were desertions. In Moscow there were protests. Clearly, it was 
tremendous blow. Uh, be, both because I, uh, for me it was two things that I was ashamed that my country abuses its small neighbor, 12 million people and our country is 220 million or so. And we are abusing uh, that little neighbor who didn't do anything except uh, spoke up because they even didn't do any reforms. They just started to speak about reforms and suddenly we crushed them. But it also was the second undercurrent was that it was against our hopes for changes in the Soviet Union. Pavel Litvinov and a small group of friends made a brave gesture. They went to Red Square and unfurled banners opposing the invasion of Czechoslovakia. On my banner, um, which I held, uh, there was a, uh, my favorite slogan, very important for me, for our and your freedom. It was a historical uh, 19th century slogan, which meant uh, that no country can be free if it, it oppresses the other country. So for me, it was very, very close uh, slogan. And there were other slogans um, uh, people were holding along the same lines, uh, long live free and independent Czechoslovakia. It was very important to, to know that we were all followed by KGB. And today I have no doubts that KGB knew about our demonstration. And then these uh, people started to run up to us. Probably it was the same KGB people or some other people who were running. And they started to yell at us immediately. Um, and it was very important that they were carrying, uh, the women were carrying shopping bags, uh, which were uh, filled with something heavy. I think it were books. Some people thought it were bricks. And men had a very heavy um, uh, suitcases. And they started to beat us on our heads because we were sitting down. Among the protesters arrested that day on Red Square were the first editors of a brand new Samizdat newspaper, The Chronicle of Current Events. New volunteers came forward to compile the only trustworthy source of opposition news. The first issues of The Chronicle tended to preach a bit. It was written emotionally. Then, gradually, the tone became more impartial, scientific, more reliable, accurate, scrupulous. A lot of our information came like this. We weren't allowed into the courts, but the relatives were. They'd try and make a tape recording, either right there in the court, if they could get away with it. If not then, immediately afterwards. <coughs> The editorial board, well, it wasn't a board really, just a small group of people who produced the issues, we would meet in one of our flats, or sometimes in the flat of a friend, to distract the attention of the KGB. And yes, we always tried to find a flat that wasn't bugged, because most of our flats were bugged. We can prove it too. It was very hard work, of course, completely exhausting. For example, we couldn't make any noise at all because there wasn't supposed to be anyone in the flat. And that gave us serious problems. Even flushing the toilet became a major operation. <laughs> yes, one of us was a bit deaf. We had to talk loudly to him. But we managed. We'd pour water into the toilet little by little, so nobody could hear it flush. <laughs> Their enemy was the KGB. The Committee for State Security was the latest in a long list of names for the secret police. Soviet newsreels concentrated on their work as border guards, defending the physical frontiers of the empire. But these were the guardians of ideology too. They were led by a dedicated hard-working communist called Yuri Andropov, addressing graduates at the KGB Academy. <laughs> It's based on the ideology. They want you, you know, as individual, not only as a slave who works for them, like in ancient slavery. 
They want your soul, they want you to believe in them. During a wave of arrests in 1972, Viktor Krasin was pulled in by the KGB. He was paraded before a press conference with his friend Piotr Yakir. At their trial, they pleaded guilty and repented their previous slanders on the Soviet human rights record. They implicated about 200 other dissidents. So when they broke us, uh, they, our friends, couldn't forgive us. And uh, that's exactly what K KGB wanted, to break the moment, you know, to make people enemies. In 1974, two Jewish dissidents were sentenced to death in Leningrad. We have appealed for the lives and the freedom of the Jews. They had tried to hijack an aeroplane to the West to gain publicity for the campaign to allow Soviet Jewry to emigrate to Israel. One of the hijackers was Edward Kuznetsov. First of all, we were anxious to find a small plane to buy all tickets in order all passengers were only our friends, people who wanted to immigrate. And uh, in order, there was no blood during this operation because we thought it very, very impo important that uh, to show to the world that we are not real hijackers, we are just people who are in desperate, desperate situation and wanted to immigrate. It was our plan. And by the way, when we went to air, uh, the airport at the uh, last day when we were arrested, there was about a regiment of KGB, a real regiment of KGB um, border troops under every bush, under every tree with, you know, binoculars and cars and so on, so many of them. <laughs> so. It was a very, uh, very tricky game that we saw them and they saw that we saw them and all of us pretended that nobody see it, you know. His death sentence was commuted to 15 years. By the time he arrived in Israel in 1979, a quarter of a million Soviet Jews had emigrated. KGB policy was now to get rid of troublemakers. Not all went willingly. The Nobel Prize winning author Alexander Solzhenitsyn was arrested, deprived of Soviet citizenship and thrown out of his homeland. His books continued to circulate in The Baikal Amur Railway a nationwide Komsomol construction job. It was the showpiece of the ninth five-year plan, an alternative to the Trans-Siberian Railway. BAM would harness the energies of communist youth to the unexploited wilderness of the Soviet East. The Young Communist Organization pledged its support at a special congress. Товарищ генеральный секретарь Центрального комитета Коммунистической партии Советского Союза, мы выполнить важнейшее поручение партии готовы отдать все силы, знания, жар комсомольских сердец делу Коммунистической партии, строительству коммунизма. Клянемся! 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 Six hundred volunteers left Moscow on the 27th of April 1974. They were a vanguard representing the cream of the Komsomol. It was a glorious adventure and for some a ten-year commitment to a dream of socialist progress. At the Congress, it was the call of the Komsomol, but at that moment, it felt like the call of the heart. It really did. 
И, значит, вот мы ехали, то, что мы ехали, мы ехали бесплатно. All the railway workers in the country worked one day without pay so that we could travel for nothing. They even fed us for nothing. At all the big towns, like Novosibirsk, Yaroslavl, huge crowds turned out to meet us. They gave us giant keys. From the taiga, they said, to the railway. And then they gave us a terrific send-off. The plan to relieve the Trans-Siberian took a route north from Lake Baikal to Komsomolsk and the Pacific. 100,000 people went east, most of them young communist volunteers. They cut 3,000 kilometers of track through the hostile permafrost of the eastern Siberian forest, the taiga. It cost a fortune, but the heroic scale of the idea was not matched by investment in modern engineering technology and the volunteers had more enthusiasm than skill. The boss of our team, he built an airport and a railway station in Moscow. He was a master builder. He'd been in the business for years. Well, he said, what in hell's name did I take these bloody Komsomol volunteers for, when I could have had proper working men? You pay them, they work hard, and that's that. We thought we were living in tents. We expected mud, cold, snow, mosquitoes. What we got was clean white sheets, hot running water. I know one girl who had hysterics. She said, I wanted the real tiger. The first train. Faith in human effort and technological advance is an enduring theme in Soviet life. But some of these massive projects had appalling consequences. The Aral Sea in Central Asia in 1960. In 1987, by the year 2000. Once it was the fourth largest lake in the world. Now it is shrinking, salty, poisoned, dying. Soviet scientists call it an ecological black hole. The Aral Sea is drying up because the rivers which fed it for millions of years have been diverted. Now massive irrigation schemes bring fertility to ancient deserts to grow one of the most valuable cash crops in the world cotton. In the Soviet Union of the 1970s, cotton meant money, and it meant corruption on an astonishing scale. The man in the dock is Brezhnev's son-in-law, Yuri Churbanov. He was arrested in a notorious scandal involving cotton, diamonds, and the Moscow State Circus. He got 10 years. The trial in 1988 exposed graft, cruelty, and rot at the very top. It's not only a question of dresses. Cotton has important military uses too. But even so, the problems of the peasants who grew it came low down the government's list of priorities. In fact, Soviet Central Asia was called Comrade Brezhnev's 101st problem. Leonid Brezhnev went several times to Uzbekistan to meet the local party chief, Sharaf Rashidov, and to exhort the cotton growers to fulfill increasingly impossible production targets. Sharaf Rashidov spoke, first secretary of the Uzbek party. Brezhnev interrupted him and said, 
Sharaf, will you have five and a half million tons? Rashid Af hesitated. Come on, just round up the figures. Yes, said Rashid Af, we will. Well, watch it, Brezhnev said. If you don't, that'll be the end of you. You'll be out of a job. A few years later, the same thing happened again. Same place, same Uzbek party conference hall. Sharaf, will you have six million tons? Without any hesitation, he replied, we will. But they didn't even have five million tons, not even five million. They just faked the figures. The cotton targets rose in an atmosphere of self-congratulation. But the land was being poisoned by chemical pesticides, fertilizers and defoliants, and thousands of peasants were drawn into a web of fear and falsehood. Let's say the harvest is in and there just isn't enough cotton to fulfill the targets. What the collective farm boss does is, he goes to the head of the cotton factory for help. The farm boss makes a deal to pay so-and-so much money per ton, effectively buying the cotton back off the factory. The factory boss has no qualms about taking the farm's money because he knows both the party and the civil servant will protect him, cover up for him whenever he needs it. The collective farm president gets the money to pay the factory from the cotton pickers. It's their money. It's the money they should have been paid. He prepares a document, all apparently above board. The cotton workers have to sign for the money, but it's money they've never had. Ibrahim Buriev tried to blow the whistle. All his protests got him was five years in prison. Much later, the Uzbek party was purged and hundreds of low-level farm managers stood trial. Here, the witness testifies that she did indeed sign for money she had not received. The defendants were convicted of stealing 1,430,331 rubles and 46 kopecks. All over the empire, the demands of the plan put honesty and imagination to the test. Until Perestroika, the manager of this factory in Moscow needed formidable powers of invention. Practically all through the Brezhnev years, the years of stagnation we call them now, it was the same. They gave us totally unrealizable production targets. I did keep proper accounts, but I kept them to myself and kept quiet. And by never dealing in specifics and always using slogans and generalizing, I managed to cover up. Like everyone else, I nodded and smiled, but in reality, we knew. We knew what was coming. But there was nothing we could do about it in those days. Even if you tried, you weren't likely to get very far. <laughs> they started to hand out medals. They gave out medals for anything, for the five-year plan, for just about everything. There was nothing else to give. Now we understand what a farce it was, but then we accepted it. We've all got our medals. <laughs> but it was just the system. During the Brezhnev years, consumer demand was growing fast. To meet it, a flourishing black economy grew up in the shadow of the plan. For years, the government turned a blind eye to the resourceful entrepreneurs who got rich on the side, on the left, as the Russian expression has it. When the crackdown came, it was targeted on the southern republics, 
in Georgia on one talented rag trade factory manager. The workers at the factory were producing goods for the black market. 80% of what they made went to fulfill the plan, and 20% they kept for themselves. They did it by economizing. Say a piece of cloth should weigh 40 to 50, they made it only 35 to 20. So the material was still the same length, but it was thinner than specified by the plan. It was a crime by the standards of those days. But today we're looking for men like Lazishvili to get the economy going again. We were just creating new products. It wasn't the atomic bomb we were making. We were simply using existing materials to design goods for which there was a huge demand in the Soviet Union. The Lazishvili family have plenty to celebrate now they are reunited. After 15 years in prison, he's even got his old job back. The entrepreneurial talents of the Georgian people were not the only problem facing their local communist chiefs in the 1970s. Georgians had not forgotten their brief period of autonomy after the revolution of 1917. They remained a proud and independent people. So when in 1978 the Brezhnev government introduced a new constitution, university students like Vasily Magliperidze were furious. It included a clause which gave the Russian language equal rights with Georgian. We were all involved, all my student friends, from every faculty in the university. And in those last few days, no one did any academic work at all. The campus was buzzing, just like a giant beehive. Thousands marched on the government building where the Georgian Supreme Soviet was meeting. The local party was led by an anti-corruption campaigner who had to travel in a bulletproof car. His name was Edward Shevardnadze. Opening the debate on the new constitution, he spoke in Georgian. <laughs> Shevardnadze read out the constitution point by point, and he read very slowly, it seemed to me, as if he was trying to stretch the time out. The whole hall knew everyone would be up in arms if the result wasn't what they wanted. With thousands of students massed outside, the Georgian party leadership was in frantic telephone communication with Moscow, pleading with the Politburo to drop the offending clause and avoid serious trouble. The nod came down from Moscow just in time for the vote. After that, we had the definite feeling that we had achieved something. Everyone realized it wasn't independence, but we had shown our strength of will in standing by our opinions. It was, after all, the first time that the government had ever taken back one of its orders. In the summer of 1980, the Olympic Games came to Moscow.
Brezhnev opened an Olympiad boycotted by Western nations. The intervention in Afghanistan had begun the previous Christmas. A decade of war lay ahead. Moscow Olympics went ahead in celebration of youth and vigor, qualities in short supply in the Kremlin. <laughs> Leonid Brezhnev during the 1982 elections. His slurred speech betrayed failing health. He had suffered his first stroke in 1976. His illness was kept from the Soviet public by an obedient press and television. Film editors working on newsreels and documentaries found their skills increasingly put to the test. This film was called A Meeting with an Interesting Person. I've worked a long time at the studio as an editor. And I've had to correct lots of bits of speech. And of course, the most difficult person to edit was Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, especially in the last years of his life, when he spoke very badly. I mean, he even got letters mixed up in his words. Once he said, I am a man who service served at the front. And from something this short, I had to try and cut out the offending letters and put in letters from a different word, so that he said served. But we were thankful when it was only a little slip of the tongue. From Calcutta to Handoi, he said once. Well, we cut out the D and we got from Calcutta to Hanoi, so that was OK. Then he'd go sort of... Once I had five minutes of film and I had to cut out 35 tuts. There were younger men in the party hierarchy, men like the agriculture secretary Mikhail Gorbachev, too young for the job when Brezhnev died in 1982. The new general secretary was Yuri Andropov, filmed here as he took leave of his old colleagues at the KGB. <coughs> Andropov's leadership gave the first taste of what we now call perestroika. But it wasn't liberalism that moved him. Wherever he looked, he saw lazy, slack, undisciplined behavior. He wanted to kick an idle and drunken labor force into working harder. In accordance with an old Soviet tradition, he assumed that issuing an order would bring results. And Dropov clamped down hard. One of his first targets was the legendary fraud and bribery in the empire's grocery shops. It was a sudden change in policy which led to thousands of arrests and embarrassed huge numbers of party functionaries. The manager of this shop had first-hand experience of the party's attitude before the sudden clean-up. The party called me in and said, why aren't you fulfilling your plan? And I said, I don't know, they just don't bring me enough goods. You don't know how to get goods? Ask the other shop directors how they do it. And I said, I know how they do it. They go to the wholesaler and give bribes. 
We well, that's not our affair. You just make sure that your shop has a full assortment of goods on sale. And what with that and pressure from my shop workers, from that time on, I started to give bribes. I started to fulfill the plan. They started to praise me. Rosyakov was already retired when he was picked up by the police. He served four years in prison. Some offenders were shot. There was less food in the shops than ever. For the dissidents, too, Andropov's rule meant hard times. After years of struggle, the chronicle of current events was forced to close. I think it really was the most difficult time, a time of general pessimism. Some of us were in prison, some left the country, some just left the movement. It just wasn't physically possible to do anything anymore. Moscow was empty. Of course, there were still a few kitchens, like this one, where you could talk openly. But that was all. It all felt pretty hopeless. No one paid attention to Sakharov's excellent words. An interviewer asked him, do you have any hope? He replied, no, probably not. Not for any speedy change, but history is like a mole. It burrows away unnoticed. Andropov had only 15 months to begin the program of reform and discipline. His successor, Konstantin Chernenko, led the mourning at the great state funeral in February 1984. But the new man was himself so ill, he could barely raise his hand in salute. I can't think of anything to say about Konstantin Chernenko, except that he lasted just into 1985. And I remember that year well. It was the year a Soviet paper described some of my writing as slime worse than Goebbels. But, like many others, I was eventually rehabilitated. For later in the year, the world discovered a new hero. I like Mr. Gorbachev. We can do business together. The West loved him. He was vigorous, energetic, charming. He said, we have to achieve a breakthrough. There is no alternative. And the world began to change. Not always quite as he expected. <laughs> 